Good evening. Are you out there? I mean, they, they've got this structured so that I'm so far away from you. I don't know whether they figure I'm somehow uh, contagious or whether you need an escape route or whether they're just making sure that the dance floor is, uh, is available as soon as this uh, after dinner set of remarks is, uh, is completed. But let me thank you for inviting me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I normally work as a lawyer. That doesn't provide me with any special credit among people who actually earn an honest living. Uh, but uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here and thank you very much. I had the privilege of speaking to the American Petroleum Institute in Louisiana 25 years ago and I think that's somehow linked with the invitation for me to come and speak to you. This evening I was addressing a prayer breakfast back then and uh, enjoyed my opportunity to be with friends then in the state and uh, in New Orleans at the time. But uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. A lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. I've, I served as the state auditor of Missouri and the attorney general of Missouri and the governor of Missouri and then a United States senator. I really couldn't keep a job according to my wife. And uh, politics has its ups and downs. I don't know whether you're familiar with the Rocky, I guess uh, the oil business has and gas business has ups and downs too. But maybe you would, I, I would just maybe ask you to help me illustrate the, the, uh, the cyclical and sometimes uh, volatile nature of politics if you would join me in a story. If I say something that's uh, very consoling and comforting, if you would just say with me the word ah. Can, can you give me an ah? Ah, yeah, yeah. Let me try it one more time. Ah, yeah, that's right. And if it's something that's troublesome, you would say something like, ooh, ooh. I mean troublesome. Can I hear you say, ooh, yeah. So, so I had a friend who fell out of an airplane. Ooh, yeah, that's right. It's serious. But he had a parachute on. Ah. But the parachute wouldn't open. Ooh. But he was headed for a haystack. Ah. He missed the haystack. Ooh, you know, that's the way life is. You know, you have these oohs and ahs. Uh, I, even, I even blew the joke. I was supposed to say the pitchfork had a haystack. I mean, a haystack had a pitchfork in it. And that was to be an ooh. And then he missed the pitchfork. And that was to be an ah. But he missed the haystack. That's the fun. You know, and, and having a lost elections in three out of the last four decades, I feel like I have something in common with the oil and gas industry, with the sort of ups and downs of life there. And I'm the only person in the history of the United States Senate to have lost his Senate seat to a deceased opponent. And so, uh, who is right? You, I, I, I think you get it. And uh, so it's, it's kind of you to ask me to share with you this evening from my experiences, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, and and you, for you to welcome me to talk about among my experiences. I'm not going to try and preach a sermon to you, but I I like to be free to share the impact that faith has on what I what I do. Uh, uh, it's it's courageous of you. I. Uh, have always wanted to welcome the presence of God in what I did. I never felt that I was sufficient in myself to be able to do what I was charged with doing, and so I would uh, ask God to help me. About 35 years ago, when I was Attorney General of the state of Missouri, I began a process in my office of before the day began, about 7.30, so that I have a full amount of time before 8 o'clock to both read a little scripture and to discuss it with friends, to memorize some of it, and then to invite God's presence in the day. We called it ramp, read, argue, memorize, and pray. And uh, it, it was under the radar. Nobody cared about that until I, frankly, through my time as governor and through my time in the United States Senate, but when I became attorney general, it got, got distressing to some people that I would actually invite the presence of God in the decision making and the work that we did in the Department of Justice. And there were big protests and about it, the Washington Post had its headlines and the, and, and the like. And uh, I was with uh, President Bush in Philadelphia. We had 
announced a program to reduce gun violence by prosecuting gun criminals. I, I like uh, President Bush's sort of hands-on, reasonable approach. The way you get rid of gun crimes is to put criminals in jail. I mean, uh, I, you know, that's a, and it, it's worked very much. The New York Times never seemed to understand it. We had the privilege, and I'm pleased to say that there are a couple of our U.S. attorneys with us here this evening. I don't want to embarrass them by making them stand up, but we drove gun crime to the lowest level in the statistics of gun crime during my first three years as the United States Attorney General, and we did so by putting people in jail who improperly abused guns and did uh, committed gun crimes. And the headlines kept reading in the, in the New York Times says, uh, Jail population remains high despite all-time low in crime. And the reason we had a low crime statistic was that the jail, but it never, it never dawned on them. So the president and I were up to, uh, to uh, uh, announce uh, this program of emphasis to uh, make it very, very difficult for people who used guns in the commission of crimes by, by incarcerating them and detaining them. And when we were finished, the president says, hop in the limo with me and work. I'm going over to see Cardinal Bellavacqua, who was the cardinal for the diocese in Philadelphia. And I did. Midway through the trip over, the president looks at me and he says, Ashy? And I said, yes, Mr. President. He says, I hear you're praying there in the Justice Department. I said, yes, sir, I am. I didn't know what he was going to say, and he just looked at me and said, don't quit. Uh, I, think, uh, I think there is a sense. There was a sense of comfort in me to know that the President of the United States understood that the responsibilities of the governance of the greatest uh, um, body politic ever known to mankind were so substantial that we would do well to welcome in ourselves a spirit of humility that re reflected our need for a special kind of wisdom and also that we would do well to ask God to help us to do our jobs and not to be ashamed or, or, or afraid of that, of that uh, in getting the job done. Uh, the people who protested my uh, willingness to invite God's presence and wisdom in what we did were afraid that I would, was trying to impose my religion on people. And I think it's important for us to know that we are not to impose our religion on people. And I, I put it this way, it's against my religion to impose my religion on people. If I believe that God created us and he created us to be free, and yet he restrained himself from imposing himself on us, it would be the height of arrogance. Even more arrogant than a Republican, or even more arrogant than a public official to think that, hey God, you should have done this, but since you forgot to, I'm gonna impose you on mankind. And I think morality and things of spirit are not the subjects of imposition, they can't be. They are the subjects of exposition, you, they can be exposed and they can be shared, but they can't be imposed. I watched the Soviet Union with uh, substantial interest when the Berlin Wall went down and Glasnost appeared and freedom began to grow in the Soviet Union. People began to reflect an awareness of their spiritual nature in ways that were surprising to me. And it turned out that 75 years of stomping religion out of people in the Soviet Union didn't work that it came back very quickly and it surfaced almost as if it had been there all along and I'm sure it had for many. And it is that you can't stomp religion out of people and you should never stomp it into people. And it is against my religion to impose my religion but it was pleasing to have the President of the United States to indicate that he, it didn't, wasn't required that for a person to serve in public office they suddenly had to lose their uh, understanding of their spirituality that there was this component and part of the heritage of the American people that was worthy of understanding and accepting rather than expecting that it had to somehow be expunged. So when he said, don't quit, I had a sense that uh, it was good to have that support from the very top. Great leaders don't impose. 
great leaders inspire. There is a difference between governance, which is to mandate things and then to impose things, and leadership, which is to model things and to inspire things. And leaders uh, get involved in the business of modeling the highest and best and inspiring people to do it. Uh, those who are involved in, I got a lot of competition here. I don't know who these guys, hey, you guys in the back, hey. Uh, I'm sort of used to competition. I used to be in the United States Senate, but <laughs> Uh, uh, great leaders have the opportunity to inspire. And when you think that uh, Jesus didn't come to mandate that people be their highest and best, but he came to inspire it. And all the great leaders, whether you're talking about uh, Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King, these were people who inspired people to their highest and best. You know, the business of governance is not what takes people to their highest and best. You can't mandate that people operate at their highest and best. You can't beat the best out of people. It has to be a, a subject of inspiration. Governance is really the process of setting the lowest and least standards. You know, if you don't get above these standards, we'll mandate that you spend time as an incarcerated person. Uh, leadership, which carries you to your highest and best, is much high, higher than the threshold or the lowest and least that governance provides. So it's with that in mind that uh, I have the opportunity to be with you, and I thank you very much for your, your willingness to, to let me share with you some of my experiences. September 11th dawned in Washington, D.C. as a day which I think uh, has to be characterized as, well, weather-wise, as a severe clear. It was one of those crystal fall days uh, that... Uh, was almost inspiring in itself. And the President of the United States had gone to Florida in an attempt to sort of highlight for people uh, the need to, to promote literacy. And we don't need to rehearse the value of literacy to a free people, but people who participate in the decision-making, shaping the future. Remember Tom Paine's maxim, we have it within our power to make the world over again. Well, you have to be knowledgeable, literate, and understanding in order to participate in that process. President Bush was keenly aware of that and asked members of the Senate to follow his example. He had gone to Florida to read with school children. I was sent to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was already in Florida on that morning. I took a few folks from the Justice Department with me in the airplane to head for... Uh, uh, Milwaukee, and we were between, as a matter of fact, I, I, I relish a clear day of flying when you can see the features that just show you that the maps are right. You know, you look down and say, well, there is Chicago, there is Detroit, there's Cleveland, look there, that's Lake Erie, wow. We were between Kalamazoo, Michigan on the right and, and Grand Rapids on the left, and uh, fisherman that I am, I was, I've always loved Grand Rapids with the Grand River coming right down through the middle of town. People can, can on some, some parts of the year, catch the salmon in the, on their lunch hours. And I was pointing that out to some of the young people in the plane when the pilot barked in my direction from the cockpit. General Ashcroft called the command center in the Justice Department. I'd been summoned to call a command center on previous occasions, but this was obviously a unique call. After being informed about the, the tragedy in New York and the developing tragedy as it related to 9-11, I turned to the other individuals in the cockpit and said the, I literally said these words, the world will never be the same. The United States of America, having been attacked, was suffering the largest single attack and the most profound losses inflicted by a foreign power on our soil in the history of the United States of America. I quickly said to the pilot, turn this plane around, we're flying back to Washington immediately. He said, I can turn the plane around, but we can't get back to Washington. And somewhat uh, arrogantly, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, we don't have enough fuel to get near back to Washington. We need to descend refuel in Milwaukee and go back before going. So we proceeded to Milwaukee. It was the first time I had uh, encountered upon our landing a SWAT team surrounding the airplane, but there was so much uncertainty about what was happening with uh, vital resources of the United States at that time that 
We were surrounded by individuals in the black jumpsuits with the lettering and the heavy weaponry. The plane was refueled. I ordered us back into the air. Uh, I think I probably countermanded what had been instructed that planes, <coughs> planes not find their way back into the air. And we started back for Washington. We had instructions or requests to land in, in Cleveland and other places on the way back, but I persisted that we go back to Washington. A uh, few uh, 50 miles or so outside of Washington, we were held in a pattern, and uh, a fighter escort was sent to escort us into the city. Uh, I don't know if I quite understood it that way at the time, but I thought it was nice that we were being escorted. I think I realize now that had we made a wrong turn on the way into town, someone else would be making the speech to you this evening. It was more by way of protecting the city than it was by way of protecting those of us in that plane. I landed and they threw the Kevlar coat on me and we started to head for the undisclosed location you all have heard about where the continuity of government could be assured in a place remote from Washington, D.C. and safe from, at least in some measure, safe from attack by individuals outside. Uh, obviously, the traffic around Washington, D.C. was so severely congested that it was difficult to move. And when I saw people jogging past us, I said to the security folks who had us in, in one of the, you know, well-armored uh, vehicles that carries public officials with the two-inch glass windows and the things like that, I said, you need to get this across the median. We need to go to that other side of the highway where it flows freely going back into town. We need to begin to address this problem and we'll just take our chances in Washington. The next day, the president returned from Florida. And let me just say that it was in the national interest for the president to stay away from Washington at that time when there was so much uncertainty. And uh, when he did, I remember in our meeting the next day at the White House, him looking in my direction and saying to me, at least in my direction, he did, I don't remember him using my name, but he just said, don't ever let this happen again. Now, let me just say to you that one of the great characteristics of excellence in leadership is clarity. And that was clear to me. It wasn't, boy, it'd be great if you could sort of do what you can possible to avoid and devalue the potential that there might be a reoccurrence. Can we reduce the probabilities? No. Just don't let this happen again. And uh, this president was clear throughout the entirety of the war on terror. And uh, I, it's a little distressing to see the mixed signals that keep coming back and forth now relating whether we're willing to call it a war, whether we're willing to confess that terrorism is a threat, whether we're willing to deal with circumstances in the national interest, like to try individuals in military commissions if the disclosure of information would in fact impair the national interest or uh, and somehow infringe the security of American liberties. And it was uh, strange indeed to awaken this week to news that this administration, which had again now reversed itself, saying that not only would they try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, the mastermind of the 9-11 bombings in a military commission, but they had decided to try him and exercise the responsibilities of the commission in Guantanamo. Uh, frankly, that was exactly where we had expected it to happen years ago, but we have like a almost like a drunken sailor careening down the highway toward the base. We have weaved from one lane to the next, and it's pleasing, at least if we can uh, land on this with certainty, to know that we have finally developed a policy that has clarity. Let me just say, clarity is a fundamental aspect of leadership. Now, with the president saying to me, don't ever let this happen again, he's basically saying, we've got to have things different than they have been. It happened before, it can't happen again. Uh, the business schools at the great university all help you understand things by saying that your system is perfectly designed to give you what you're getting. Think about that. If you don't like what you're getting, you probably have to change your system. Einstein put it this way, ignorance is defined as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. 
My Norwegian immigrant grandfather put it this way. He said, Jan, I saw this board off four times and it's still too short. You know, uh, <laughs> some of you will get it on the way home. Uh, uh, the point is, if you don't like what you, you're getting, you've got to change what you're doing. And I think that's, that's true about life. If, if where we are in life isn't satisfying to us, we've got to change what we're doing or we will not change what we're getting. So we launched on a variety of different things to change what we were doing. We changed the priorities of the department from being priorities on prosecution and you can understand the pyrrhic nature of prosecution as a strategy for interdicting terrorism. When the terrorist seeks to destroy himself in the perpetration of the crime, threatening to prosecute him really isn't a very big deterrent to the achievement of his objectives. So the uh, first thing we did was to flip from a prosecution mode, not saying we wouldn't prosecute and, and shouldn't prosecute, but our priority became prevention instead of prosecution. And secondly, we decided it was time to have a wide variety of tools available for anti-terrorism, which had previously only been available in a variety of other settings for law enforcement. And I just would give you a couple. And I understand you had a speaker this morning who spoke in derogation of the Patriot Act. I wish I had been here because I, I believe the Patriot Act has been singularly responsible for our ability to interdict terrorist plots that will have taken s significant amounts of American freedom and liberty from us. And those who are alleged to have been offended by abuses perpetrated under the Patriot Act are hard to find. It's like hen's teeth. They're easy to talk about, but you just can't find them. You can strangle as many chickens as you want, but you won't find many hen's teeth. One of the couple things I'll give you just for example, but there was a tremendous uh, debate in the country over the Patriot Act. One of the things we decided we would provide in the anti-terrorism universe was what's called the roving wiretap. Now let me tell you, sometimes Washington labels things in ways that are just very, very unwise. I mean, roving wiretap, doesn't that sound sinister? Don't you just conjure up the idea of guys with trench coats on, sort of FBI types with big alligator clips, walking around looking for your telephone line to find out whether you like, uh, you know, uh, mushrooms on your pizza or to listen in on your conversations. Uh, roving wiretap was something that was developed in this country to deal with organized crime not in the year 2001 in response to terrorism, but in the late 80s in response to criminals who, because they wanted to avoid surveillance, would use throwaway telephones, the kind we all use all the time now, the kind you can buy at the local 7-Eleven or what some people refer to as the stop and rob store. And you uh, take the phone and use it for five days and throw it away because it takes five days to get a court order to tap a particular phone. And prior to the roving wiretap, that's exactly what the court order was for, that a particular piece of hardware would be the subject of surveillance, as if it were the evil itself. So as soon as it was thrown away, you had to go to a court again and get authority to tap the next one. And if that took five days, all you had to do was rotate phones every five days. You could avoid surveillance. So for the, for the dozen years between the late 80s and 2001 for organized crime and things less sinister than some like nursing home fraud and other things, we had the authority to order that we weren't surveilling the piece of equipment, but that no matter what piece of equipment a suspect used, you could listen to the suspect not just surveil the piece of equipment. We decided if that worked and passed all the constitutional checks and tests and all the measures to safeguard personal liberties that were inherent in the American system, if it worked against organized criminals and people involved in welfare fraud, it could work against terrorists and it would be okay. So the roving wiretap, the ability to tap a, or to surveil a person, no matter where he moved, or how many different phones he used, you could surveil the person instead of the piece of equipment that was reasonable. That was one of the 
major pieces. Another thing was called the delayed notification search warrant. Since the 1970s in crime control in virtually every circuit around the United States there had been authorized by federal judges something known as the delayed notification search warrant. It meant that in certain cases you could search without giving notice that you were doing the search. If a federal judge oversaw it, supervised it, because giving notice about the search might in fact aid the perpetrators of a crime. Imagine this, you get notice that a particular explosive device is to be found at a particular location because it was to be delivered on Tuesday. You think it's this Tuesday. You launch the search, you find out that it's not there, but it's pretty clear that it could have meant next Tuesday. Now, if you have to give notice on this Tuesday that you searched it, and you can't wait until next Tuesday to search it again when it really is coming in, by giving notice, you really disrupt your capacity to interdict the criminal activity. This is used in the drug wars for years, as I said, since the 1970s under the supervision of federal judges and always with the federal judge oversight. It was made available in the, against terrorists in the same way that it had been made available against people in the war on drugs. When the Patriot Act instituted that, there were things like that, this toolkit of things which had been available, tested, understood, and a part of the process in other criminal areas had not been available to our war on terror and we needed to use all the approved and constitutional tools that were part and parcel of our war on crime. We needed to have those available in the war on terror and that's what happened with the Patriot Act. I might add, obviously you remember it was Tuesday, the 11th of September. By Saturday, we had scoured the statutes to find these additional authorities, loaded them into the Patriot Act, and we had presented to the Congress this list of things that were robust authorities that should be available against terror perpetrators because they were available against the garden variety criminals in the United States and we at least ought to have the same capacity to interdict terrorism that we had to detect and prosecute criminal behavior. I can't go through the law one by one, but let me just give you that, that that's really the same. And of course, you'll remember that the ACLU and everybody had the whole country up in their arms about it, that this was uh, something that was uh, really threatening, that America could no longer exist as the land of the free. I just want you to know that uh, our ability was substantially enhanced. And uh, my friends who are here from the Justice Department will remember the Lacani case in New Jersey, where as a result of our ability to do things provided for in the Patriot Act, we were able to interdict the importation of shoulder-fired missiles that were to be used as a part of a plot to bring down airplanes. Now, you and I know that it only takes one good shoulder-fired missile close to an airport bringing down an airliner to ruin your whole day. It goes beyond that. That would be a, a, an understatement that is just beyond measure. And our ability to interdict those kinds of shipments, and that's a, that's a case on which there has been a conviction and individuals are serving time. That's the kind of service to the American people that the Patriot Act has provided without impairing our liberties. Yes, there are things that we have to do from time to time that we didn't have to do previously. We have to endure security at our airports, but I'd rather fly securely having endured security than I would be to invite additional attacks using airplanes as weapons, not only against major buildings uh, in a governmental or private sense, but uh, uh, to use use a loaded, fuel-laden airplane as an attack against any part of our culture. And that's really the outcome that came as a result of our saying, you know, if we want to change the outcome, we've got to change how we conduct ourselves. We've got to change what we're doing. The system is perfectly designed to give us what we're getting. We don't like what we got. We change from a prosecution model in terms of priorities to a prevention model. We change from restraining ourselves, not using all of the full array of tools that are used in the criminal law against terrorism, to exercising the capacity against terrorists that we exercise against common criminals in an effort to keep and maintain the safety and security of the United States of America. There one story which always uh, I, I enjoyed telling about my time going to the Throgmorton School in Alexandria. 
there was such a hysteria in the country about the liberties that were being lost to the Patriot Act, and I was giving a little, a little uh, talk uh, to the students, and uh, Freddie at the back of the class is waving his hand just excitedly. And I said, Freddie, what is it? He says, well, I have a three-part question for you. Now, let me tell you, if you're talking to the fourth grade and some kid has a three-part question, you're, you're in trouble already. But he says, he says, Ashcroft, General Ashcroft, he said, pardon me. He said, Ashcroft, he said, uh, if you're as smart as you think you are, how come you haven't found Osama bin Laden? I said, uh, what's your second question? He, he, he said, uh, he, he said, well, the second part of my question is, is uh, if you guys are as good as you purport to be, how come you haven't found the weapons of mass destruction? I said, yeah, and, you, and your third question is, and he said, uh, well, your, my third question is, I'm really concerned about my rights under the Patriot Act. And I demand a complete explanation of the Patriot Act and how my rights have been infringed under the Patriot Act. Just then, the recess bell rings and the kids empty out of the room. And they're gone for a while. They come back 15 minutes later. They all come back into the room. And, and Lisa, this little girl, is waving her arm, I mean, practically this way. And I said, Lisa, what is it? She says, well, I have a five-part question. I said, a five-part question? She said, yeah, the first one is, if you're as smart as you think you are, where's Osama bin Laden? The second question, I, she says, if you guys are as, as, as good as you say you are, how come you haven't found the weapons of the mass destruction? And my third part of the question is, uh, I'm really concerned about my rights under the Patriot Act, and I want a complete explanation. I said, and your fourth question? She said, my fourth question is, why did the recess bill ring 20 minutes early? And my fifth question is, where's Freddie? She said, so uh, <laughs> Well, I just want to say to you that I, I'm grateful to God that we've had the opportunity to defend American freedom and we've been successful in doing it and that this country has an opportunity to continue to exist in freedom. And we have an opportunity to hand to the next generation a nation which hopefully is more replete with opportunity and freedom than was the nation which was handed to us. I believe that ascending opportunity is at the core of what it means to be American. Three out of four of my grandparents came to these, these shores voluntarily at significant sacrifice. They showed up here for one reason. They believed that we were a place where each generation would hand to the next generation a higher set of opportunities and a greater opportunity to exercise freedom and liberty and reach the potential that God placed within them than had ever existed before. That's the only reason they came. They didn't come because they thought we were on a downhill slide. And this is part and parcel of what it means to be an American, in my judgment. Uh, and it, it's something that we have deeply embedded in our culture. I, I have, I'm the privileged and blessed by God to have three children, and each of my children has been involved in the Scouts. And the Scouts have a, a sort of a slogan about the way they do things. They always leave the campground just a little bit better than they found the campground. I think that's what we're about. And I believe that's what America is for. And I frankly am worried about the campground right now. And I'm not just worried about it in terms of the economics. Although some of what I'm worried about has manifestations in economics, I think it has to do with the moral and character and spiritual health of America. I think, yes, we need to leave the next generation with a set of opportunities, but we need to leave them with a heritage of behavior which reflects values which will sustain them and will sustain their trajectory of America toward a place of ascending opportunity instead of descending opportunity. It stuns me, it frightens me. I am significantly distressed to think that we are living high at the expense of our grandchildren. I think it is immoral to think that we should spend ourselves into pleasure with the expectation that our comfort and pleasure 
would be supported by those who have yet to cast a vote and some of whom are not yet in existence that we would export those things that we want, the cost of them, give the tab to the generations to come. I think it is incumbent upon us to be people of integrity. And I don't think there is integrity in saying we will consume it and they will pay for it. I think it is incumbent upon us to be people of responsibility. And I don't think there is responsibility in the idea that somehow we will uh, act as if we are giving away our own resources. Uh, compassion is a wonderful thing undertaken on the basis of one's own resources. But compassion to those who are at hand by theft from those who are not here is simply a very, very difficult setting. It is nothing short of immoral to steal from our own grandchildren. Uh, I, I pray that God will inspire me to a life of integrity at which I keep my own word and am more concerned about keeping my own word than finding problems with someone else's word. That I would be inspired to have compassion, but compassion with my own resources. And that I would live with responsibility. This idea of ascending responsibility is one of the things I pray for. And uh, the idea of compassion, that we would be sacrificial in our approach rather than consumptive in our approach so that we would spend our resources in making things possible for other people rather than spending our resources in making things impossible for other people. Is, is spending their resources is, is, is something that's important for me. And I think it's part of the leadership that each of us owes to the next generation. And the model, the great model of leadership in my judgment in this respect was Jesus who decided that he would be sacrificial in order that other people would have opportunity rather than he would live it up and be consumptive and ex express, deny responsibility of his own and impose responsibility on others. And I think this is a model for us. This is why I think it's important for America to enjoy some sense, uh, uh, to consider the questions of that relate to spirituality, not that it's to be imposed on everyone, but to understand that the spirit of sacrifice that has existed in America that makes it possible for us to have enjoyed the benefits we've enjoyed has to be understood. And if we abandon that spirit of sacrifice so that we just enjoy a time of consumption as a nation, those who follow us will be in serious distress. And so I, I think the model is clear to us that uh, when we want um, to, to see what it is we could do that would bring the highest and best opportunity to the next generation, we have to think about giving of ourselves in the same kind of way that great leaders have given of themselves. I, I'm always struck when I look at great leaders to think about the, the, the component of sacrifice in leadership. The currency of leadership is sacrifice. Sure, the con man can tell you what you ought to do and can try and motivate you to do it, but when it comes to spending his own resources, he's not there. It reminds me of the people around the world who are willing to defend freedom to the last drop of American blood, not their own. Or the guys in the locker room that I remembered when I was playing football who would beat on the lockers till your ears rang and say, we've got to go out there and get them. And as soon as you stepped onto the field, they'd offer to hold your slicker while you went out there to fight the enemy. And we need to be in a position of understanding what it means to be sacrificial in terms of the next generation. And the way that comes home most profoundly to me is to understand the way in which my opportunity has been enhanced especially by the sacrifice that my predecessors have made in, the, in their understanding of the virtue of sacrifice, of giving yourself for someone else. It's with that in mind that I am grateful for the sacrifice of the Savior for me as a person, and I 
I have always tried to welcome that understanding into, into my need to be a person of compassion, yes, but to put my willingness to participate in the compassion on the basis of my resources, at least above my willingness to try and, try and be compassionate with someone else's resources, to hope that my dedication to the objectives that are noble would be uh, based on a kind of integrity that models the right things for the future and that our responsibility would somehow uh, transcend our own desires but reflect to what we expect of the next generation. Um, America stands at a, a unique place where it's singular in terms of its world leadership. We don't any longer have a bipolar world where there's someone as a counterweight to the United States of America, but sometimes I think our counterweight is a challenge to ourselves to understand the values of real leadership and the values of, of real virtue and that those virtues are best taught to us and have been ex best exhibited to me, to me in the person that I refer to as my savior. I thank you very much for allowing me to be with you this evening. I wish you God's blessing and God bless the United States of America.